Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for today's Protocol Labs Research Seminar. Today we have ETSERG PhD candidate Leova Heimbach, who will be presenting her work eliminating sandwich attacks with the help of game theory. Leova is particularly interested in both the analytical and empirical analysis of decentralized exchanges for her research. Before starting her PhD, she received both her bachelor's and master's degrees from ETH Zurich and spent a semester at the Chinese University of Hong Kong during her master's studies. Thank you so much for joining us today, Leova. I'm really excited for your presentation. I look forward to learning about your uh, research. Thank you, and welcome also from here, uh, from me, and also welcome for the opportunity to be for me to be able to present here today. So the work that I will present here today focuses on the possibility of eliminating sandwich attacks, which are a common um, front-running attack on decentralized exchanges with the help of game theory. And it was done together with Roger Wattenhofer at ETH Zurich. So I'll start um, with an introduction of a broad introduction of decentralized finance and then in particular decentralized exchanges. Even though cryptocurrencies are decentralized, they were mainly traded on what is referred to as centralized finance until recently. Uh, but then in the past years, decentralized finance has surfaced uh, mainly on the Ethereum blockchain and has replaced many traditional finance services pertaining to cryptocurrencies, such as pen, uh, payments, lending, and borrowing. Decentralized finance makes financial products basically available to anyone um, on the blockchain, such as Ethereum, which I mentioned previously, and anyone can use. So if you want to participate in decentralized finance, you don't have to go through a middleman like banks or bro uh, brokerages, but can directly interact with the protocols. And we focus on one service in particular, decentralized exchanges. So in centralized finance or traditional finance, and when you want to buy cryptocurrencies, this generally goes to the limit order book mechanism, and, and this is typically just used to match buyers and sellers. So here you see a picture of an order book, and the transactions are then processed through a financial intermediary, such as Binance, for instance, when we're talking about cryptocurrencies. And then um, recently, however, decentralized exchanges have emerged, and they are basically just smart contracts on the blockchain that allow users to trade cryptocurrencies without the needs for any financial intermediaries. So if we have Alice and Bob here and they want to exchange Bitcoin for Ether, they can do this directly with a decentralized exchange without involving any intermediary. Note that in reality, it's generally not Alice that exchanges their assets directly with Bob. The Ethereum transaction fees, um, which is the home for most decentralized exchanges, um, the fees that are charged by Ethereum pay for the consumption of computational resources and complicated transactions can get expensive very quickly. And therefore, decentralized um, exchanges generally function in what is known as automated market makers or AMMs for short. And basically, AMMs, they do not maintain an order book. And uh, this simplicity um, allows them to have a relatively low execution cost. So in the later analysis, we focus on a particular subclass of AMMs and also the biggest one of them that is currently implemented, which are constant product market makers. And basically what constant product market makers do is they aggregate liquidity in what is referred to as liquidity pools. And so anyone can participate as a liquidity provider in such a pool and then earn fees from the transactions that execute for the pool. So if we go back to Alice, that, who wants to exchange Bitcoin for EFA directly with the liquidity pool, she does this just by interacting with the respective smart contract. So let's dive into the actual specifics of these constant product market makers. They're some of the biggest or the biggest in particular uh, decentralized exchanges are constant product market makers or a variation thereof, such as Uniswap, SushiSwap, and PancakeSwap, for instance. And we, in the analysis, in particular, focus on Uniswap v2 in the following. But the functionality of these exchanges is identical. And also for exchanges that implement a different variation of constant product market makers, a similar analysis would apply. So basically, in a constant product market maker, um, we have a liquidity pool for every token pair. And in this example, we have a liquidity pool for Bitcoin and Ether. 
So this pool basically just aggregates from individual liquidity providers and liquidity of the two assets. So any liquidity provider can come and deposit both assets in this pool. The pool then basically just holds the reserves of um, both these assets. So now we um, consider such a pool between a token X and a token Y. And in the case of a constant product market maker, trading then happens along the price curve, which is drawn here. Basically, this price curve just um, ensures that the two amounts of um, that the product of the two amounts of tokens stays constant, which is where the name comes from. So we look at an example trade in such a market. We have a trade that wants to exchange tokens X for tokens Y, with the current pool state being indicated in the graph. So we have 90X and 118Y in the pool currently. This means that the pool's current marginal price is that there is one X you receive for every two Y, which um, basically follows from the pool's reserves, the ratio between the two. And then we have a trade that comes in that wants to exchange 30 tokens X for token Y. And according to the price curve, the trader would now receive 45 tokens Y for the 30 token X. Note, however, that liquidity providers also get a bit for providing liquidity. And in the case of Uniswap V2, this is a percentage fee that is charged on the input amount of 0.3%. And basically, for each trade that executes through the pool, this is charged on the input. So our trade needs to put in an additional 0.9x uh, in order to receive the full 45y. And further, we also notice here that even though these markets are commonly referred to as constant product market makers, the product, in fact, does not stay entirely constant in reality due to these fees that are also fed back into the pool and that then steadily increase the um, um, pool's constant product. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that at the start, the price of the pool was 1x for 2y. But this is not what our trader received. And this is basically because every trade is associated with what is known as expected slippage, which basically just measures the expected decrease in price based on trading volume and available liquidity. So the more the trade moves the pool across the price curve, the higher the slippage, which follows from the convexity of the price curve. And in our case, we had a very large trade in comparison to the pool reserves. So there was a lot of expected slippage. So instead of receiving um, the initial price, which was 1x is worth 2y, our trade only received 4y's for the three x's. And basically, we refer to this phenomenon or this decrease in price um, as expected slippage because it's only dependent on the pool's liquidity as well as the trade size. But there's something else that might change the price um, of the trade, which is the unexpected slippage. And this is an unexpected increase or decrease in the price based on previous trades. So transactions um, are not executed when they are submitted, but only upon inclusion in a block. So um, other transactions might um, change the pool state um, before the transaction actually executes. So we go through an example here again, and we have one trade which trades in the opposite direction. So we were selling X for Y, and this trade does the opposite. And the new starting state when our trade then executes is also now indicated as having um, 75X in the pool and 216Y. And now our trade, which has the same input amount of 30X suddenly receives 62Y, which is quite a lot more than we previously received uh, because of this um, change in the pool states before the execution. But the entire opposite can also happen. And this is maybe what we don't want. So if a trade um, comes before us, that trades in the same direction, this further increases the price of Y. And then our trade, again, with the same input amount of 30X, will now only receive 30 for Y. And this is something that um, traders do not want. We want to be able to say, oh, when my trade executes, this is sort of the worst price that I am willing to accept. And for that, you can specify a slippage tolerance, which basically just denotes the maximum acceptable price movement to you. And if this trade were to pass your maximum expect acceptable price movement, then it would automatically fail. 
And basically, um, as part of this research, we were uh, finding ways to set the slippage um, such that trade uh, optimally for traders. And before I go into that into more details, um, there are benefits to both setting the slippage tolerance high and low. So basically, higher slippage tolerances avoid automatic trade failure if the pool's price just naturally moves between the time of the transaction submission and the actual execution. So if we have a pool that has a lot of volume or the crypto prices are very volatile, then the price might move a bit and we don't want our trade to just fail them. But on the other hand, um, a low slippage tolerance lets you avoid that your trade really executes as an unwanted price. But a low slippage tolerance also lets you avoid an AMM specific front running attack, the sandwich attack, which will be the focus of this presentation. So our goal in this work was to let traders avoid the sandwich attacks by setting their slippage tolerance in a way that for one avoids the attack, but also at the same time avoids unnecessary transaction failures if the pool's price just moves naturally in the meantime. So then I will detail sort of the mechanism of the sandwich attack and why it is possible and what it really does. So the sandwich attacks make use of exactly this sort of unknown state of the pool at the execution time of a transaction when the transaction is actually submitted. So we don't know what the state of the pool is when we're submitting our transaction uh, eventually. So um, and they make use of this for one thing, uh, for one, but also make use of the price curves convexity. So let's consider a trade, which is shown here, and a trader wants to execute it, which is the same as before. We have a trader that wants to um, exchange token X for token Y. And if the trade were to execute as expected, this is what would happen. But now there's a sandwich attack, which comes and the trade will execute as is shown on the right now. We'll quickly also note um, that how this is possible. So here in the sandwich attack, we have both a front running and a back running transaction. And how would the attacker achieve such a transaction ordering? So basically the attacker sees our victim's transaction in the mempool uh, prior to the actual execution of the transaction. And then the attacker just strategically places its transaction around the victim's transactions. And there are various ways of doing this, and even services um, have surfaced that make it a lot easier for attackers. So it's quite simple for attackers to achieve such an ordering. So they have their front running transaction and their back running transaction, which sandwich the victim's transaction, hence the name of the attack. So then the first attack, uh, the first transaction that we'll now execute is the attacker's front running transaction. Uh, so the uh, transaction TA1 here which is shown in red. And this increases the price of token Y by also buying token Y, which then the victim um, has to buy um, in the second step then um, and will receive a worse price for it. And then finally, the attack is um, concluded with the attacker back running the victim's transaction and um, profiting from Y's inflated price by then again selling the tokens Y that it previously bought. And basically due to the convexity of the price curve, the attacker can make a net profit with such a sandwich attack. And um, let's quickly look at it. So if we compare the victim's trade, how it executes with and without the sandwich attack, we find that for the same input of token um, X, so if you look at the delta VX, which is shown in red here, this is the same. Uh, it receives a vastly different number of tokens Y, which is shown in yellow here. So without the sandwich attack, the victim receives many more tokens Y than with the sandwich attack, but the input is the same. And if we look at the attacker now, we observe that the attacker receives more tokens X um, from the back running transaction than it put into the initial front running transaction. So you see that the delta AX in is much smaller than the delta AX out. So the attacker receives more delta X in the end than it put in initially. Additionally, the attacker in between only puts in the delta um, AY, so the tokens Y that it received from the first front running transaction 
into the second backgrounding transaction. So the difference between the delta in and delta out is the profit that the attacker is making here. Then uh, what we did is we studied these sandwich attacks and the possibility to avoid them. And for that, we consider both the incentives of the attacker as well as those of the victim in what we refer to as the sandwich attack game. So while the attacker's incentives are generally to maximize profit, the victim's incentives are to avoid both sandwich attacks as well as unnecessary failures by, and the victim tries to achieve this by setting the slippage tolerance. And note that um, most decentralized exchanges have a standard auto slippage tolerance that they suggest their traders to use when you go through the API, for instance. And we want to, um, in this work, we want to set the slippage on the victim size such that it avoids sandwich attacks and then see how it compares to this constant auto slippage. So we start by going through the attacker's incentives which are quite simply put just to maximize profit. But the attacker needs to, um, there are a couple of relevant parameters that the attacker needs to track in order to maximize his profit. So first there is the victim's transaction and the parameters that are unique to it. So that is for one, the victim's transaction size, delta Vx, as well as the slippage tolerance that the victim indicated. And for both, we can generally say that the higher they are, the higher the profit of a potential sandwich attacks. This makes sense intuitively because if there's a, a large transaction size, there's more to attack. And if the slippage tolerance is large, then the price can be moved more by the attacker. So the victim is willing to accept more price changes, which then again increase the profitability of the attack. And further, um, the attacker must also pay fees, which obviously influence their profit. So for one, the attacker must pay a transaction fee to the liquidity pool when doing a trade. This transaction fee is um, charged on the input amount of every trade and is proportional to it. So basically, when the attacker does um, the front running transaction and when it does the back running transaction, both times it pays this transaction fee charged on the input amount relatively. And then there's also the Ethereum block fee that the attacker must pay. So this block fee is approximately absolute for the same type of transaction. So for the um, Ethereum fee, you pay for the computation as opposed to for the transaction size. And therefore, if there are two identical swaps in a decentralized exchange, we can assume that the block fee in the same block for both of them will be the same. So this is an absolute fee, um, at least to some extent that is charged for every transaction that the attacker does. And basically putting all of this together, we can analytically determine the optimal sandwich attack and then simulate the attacker's profits in the following. So here um, we sort of simulate the profit of an optimal sandwich attack depending on the transaction fee on the x-axis, which is charged as a percentage of the transaction input, and the slippage tolerance S, which we see on the y-axis. And the slippage tolerance is what the victim is setting in our um, setup, and also known to the attacker. So the shade of green in this uh, plot visualizes the attacker's profit, and basically the darker the green, the higher the profit. And um, as if we would expect, this is especially uh, high the profit when the slippage tolerance is high and the transaction fee is low. Additionally, we see that there are some white areas in this plot and here the no profit per sandwich attack would exist and therefore the attacker would not execute any attack. Also note here that this simulation disregards the block fee, so we just set it to zero. This is the absolute fee that the attacker pays for every transaction, but it would just remove a constant amount from the profit. Then basically we also simulated the same uh, for um, this varying the slippage tolerance and the transaction size of the victim relative to the reserves that are currently in the pool. 
And basically a similar picture appears and we observe that the attacker's profit increases with both the slippage tolerance and transaction size as one would have expected. But um, the general takeaway that we have here is that um, we were then able to conclude by having uh, analytically determined the attacker's optimal transaction size that the attacker's profit cannot exceed the victim's loss, which is also an intuitive finding. And this will also help us later. Note here that we say that the attacker's profit cannot exceed the victim's loss, but in most cases it will be lower because the attacker also has to pay liquidity providers, for instance, who then receive a share of the potential profit from such a sandwich attack. This basically concludes the side of the attacker and brings us to the other side of the sandwich game, which is the victim side. So what a victim is trying to do, it is just trying to set the slippage tolerance in a way to, for one, avoid sandwich attacks, and two, avoid transaction failures. Um, so if she sets a, a simple way would be if we have if we want to just avoid sandwich attacks, we always set our slippage tolerance to zero, but then we might have very frequent transaction failures and it would not be a very optimal situation. So the process of setting the slippage is a bit more involved on the victim side. And she considers these two things. So first, she calculates for which slippage tolerance her trade is not attackable. And she can basically simply do this by comparing her maximum loss, um, if a sandwich attack would incur, to the total block fees that the attacker needs to pay. Um, previously, I mentioned that the attacker's profit cannot exceed the victim's loss, and thus this is a way for her to uh, determine whether a profitable sandwich attack would exist. And then if the block feeds would exceed her maximum loss, her trade is not attackable. And this is a quite simple computation on her side. And then she basically is able to quantify or to find an SA, which um, quantifies the slippage tolerance when her trade is attackable. So more specifically, as long as her slippage tolerance is smaller than SA and um, her trade is not sandwich attackable. However, as we mentioned previously, she must also consider the cost that might be involved with her having to resend a transaction that fails when the pool's price naturally shifted in the meantime. These natural shifts can just be ordinary traders that trade in a time of high volume in a pool, for instance, or when there's high crypto price volatility and a lot of trades are going into the same direction, then we might see very high natural price movements. Basically, she also calculates SR, um, which is a lower bound for a slippage tolerance. And basically, it specifies the limit for the slippage tolerance at which the estimated cost of her transaction failing to execute does not exceed the cost of a possible sandwich attack. Um, so basically, what SR allows us to do is, or allows our victim to do, is to avoid having to potentially pay more for constantly resubmitting her trade than to just accept the sandwich attack and be done with it. So as long as um, the slippage tolerance is larger than SR, the expected cost of redoing the transaction is smaller than the cost of the sandwich attack. And then putting these two together, we get this fairly simple algorithm on the victim side um, to set the slippage tolerance. So first she calculates SA, which I mentioned previously is quite simple to calculate. Um, so this is the slippage tolerance that specifies the upper bound um, for the slippage in order to avoid a sandwich attack. And she also calculates SR, which specifies the lower bound for the slippage tolerance, such that the expected costs, which are related to some potential transaction failures, do not exceed the cost um, of a sandwich attack. And um, I mentioned that this SA is simple to compute, but SR um, is a bit more involved to compute and needs to be estimated, but I'll go into that in a moment. And then she just compares um, um, SA and SR 
And if SR is smaller than SA, the victim simply sets the um, slippage tolerance to SA or slightly smaller, and um, in that way is able to avoid a sandwich attack. And otherwise, she sets the slippage tolerance to SR and basically accepts the cost of potential sandwich attacks because her cost would be higher otherwise. Okay, and then I'll move on to basically how we compute this lower bound for the slippage tolerance, which is quite an involved process, at least a little bit more involved, where we first need to estimate the expected price changes in a pool within a block. So more specifically, the trader basically needs to be able to estimate the required slippage tolerance and the slippage tolerance she requires such that the probability of her transaction failing is P. So basically, for simple computation, the way we did is we just estimated the required slippage tolerance such that this probability of transaction failure is P to be the P percentile of these observed price changes in approval in a given sliding window. So in the next slide here, I plot some estimations of this required slippage in the USDC, which is a stable coin pack for the US dollar and EFA pool. And this is for various window sizes used for the estimation. So the window sizes here go from 200 blocks to 20,000 blocks. 200 is shown in the lightest um, blue and 20,000 is shown in the darkest blue. So these are the window sizes that are used to make this estimation. And we also make this estimation for various um, transaction failing probabilities. So this is 1% in the left plot and 10% in the right plot. And basically, um, to do these estimations, as I mentioned, we just look at a sliding window and then at the 1% percentile of the price change and then set this to the required slippage tolerance such that our trades will only fail in 1% of the cases. This is just something that is needed in order to then eventually be able to compute this lower bound for the slippage tolerance. And basically, um, what you can see here is that for um, a 1% transaction failure probability, so if we say, okay, we're fine with our transaction failing 1% of the time in this high volume pool, so USDC EFA, the required slippage is only around 0.4%. And if we say, oh, we accept 10% transaction failures, which is maybe a bit high, but just for um, visualization now, it would be 0.02% of um, uh, as a required slippage. And then because this is a sort of simple estimation that we do here, um, I also we evaluated the accuracy um, of this required slippage and show here the mean of the estimation, so mu, as well as the relative error eta for four pools. So we have again USDC EFA and then USDC, USDT, Bitcoin EFA and DPI EFA. And basically the first table now shows the estimation accuracy for failure probability, which is 1%. And the second table shows this accuracy for failure probability, which is 10%. And we find that our estimation is reasonably accurate um, for window sizes of 2,000 blocks. And after that, a larger window doesn't add more. Um, but we also see that our relative error of this sort of simple estimation is, um, can be quite large, especially in lower volume pools, such as BPI Ethereum, for instance. But this is also due to not even being able to achieve higher um, failure probabilities when um, there is a low volume in the pools and there is no, um, no price shift and no transactions would fail even if the slippage were set to zero, which is why we see some of these bigger relative errors. But the relative errors remain sort of small for the USDC Ethereum pool. So we know that in general here, um, this estimation is not very accurate, but it does its job. It is simple to compute on the victim sites, and it overestimates the required slippage rather than underestimating it. 
so um, the victims will not sort of it, this will not cause any unnecessary transaction failures on the victim sides, but just make them more careful. And then putting it all together, we would, we then computed um, this SR. So this is the lower bound for the slippage tolerance on the victim size, which specifies um, at what point the cost of the expected cost of having to redo transactions equal the costs of just accepting a, a sandwich attack. And we did this estimation over 120,000 blocks in late December of 2020, which was a time um, at which Uniswap B2 was the main decentralized exchange on Ethereum and did it in eight pools, which are shown here. And basically, this lower bound for the slippage tolerance adapts to the current pool characteristics. And we then computed for different values for and uh, we then computed different values for every block as it's different um, even with every block in the same pool and just plot the results as um, a box plot here. And um, on the left, you can see the um, results for a very small transaction size of only 10 US dollars and on the right for a very large transaction size of 100,000 US dollars or USDC. Um, but just compute it all um, to US dollar. And uh, note that um, this lower bound, um, we see a decreasing with the transaction size, um, which is basically mainly due to the cost of having to redo a transaction. So the fee that we pay to the Ethereum network just becoming comparatively slow as our transaction size grows which is the main reason why we see this as lower bound for the slippage tolerance decreasing as our um, transaction size increases. But even though our transaction size here varies by a factor of 10,000, the difference in the, this lower bound is only a factor of 10 approximately. And other than that, for both transaction sizes, we see quite similar patterns between both of them. So SR tends to be smaller for pools with lower volumes such as Link Ethereum, for instance, which is the third pool from the um, left, right in both plots. And so here we see such a um, low required slippage tolerance. And um, the largest is for USDC Ethereum, for instance, um, which has the most volume. To some extent, this is a bit counterintuitive because we would expect the prices of some more exotic cryptocurrencies to fluctuate more. But this is generally true on larger time scales when we're talking in months, for instance, but not within a block because the volume is just not there in these pools. There are many blocks um, in which no trade executes. So there are also no price fluctuations to observe in any of these blocks. Additionally, the um, lower bound for the slippage tolerance we also see it varying within a pool of, we see variations of more than a factor of five, as the pool itself might also go for periods of low and high volume. And basically what we conclude is that um, due, to the diff uh, due to this vast difference in the lower bound for the slippage tolerance that we observed both within and across pools that this constant auto slippage which is suggested by several AMMs cannot be suitable and cannot capture all trades because um, a lot varies depending on the specific pool characteristics as well as the transaction size. And then basically what we finally did in this analysis is that we did a cost comparison. So we basically simulated our algorithm to set the slippage tolerance um, over 120,000 blocks and compared then its performance to the common auto slippage, so the same slippage for every trade, independent of pool and independent of transaction size, which is commonly suggested by uh, many decentralized exchanges. I want to note here quickly that um, since the time of this writing, Uniswap has adjusted the success, uh, suggested slippage but um, we compared to the past auto slippage that they were suggesting of 0.5%. So 
So then um, these um, tables here show a cost comparison. So the costs that are incurred um, if we simulate a trade per block in these 120,000 um, blocks in these four pools for the various transaction sizes and the costs measure both the costs that there are to um, redo transactions that might fail as well as the costs created by sandwich attacks. And what we are basically able to observe is in the is that the ratio of the cost um, between the auto slippage which was suggested by Uniswap as well as the slippage that are quite simple algorithm calculated is quite significant that that our algorithm always exceeds um, the performance of the auto slippage. And basically, to just a bit of intuitively explain the results is that for very low, small transaction sizes, our algorithm basically picks a bit higher slippage tolerances to avoid completely unnecessary transaction failures, as these um, trades are not sandwich attackable anyways, which is why the ratio of the cost between the um, auto slippage special by Uniswap as well as our algorithm is infinite there. And then for large um, transaction sizes, on the other hand, the opposite is true. So our algorithm picks a bit smaller slippage tolerances and is therefore able to avoid very many sandwich attacks. Um, Why uh, the constant auto slippage basically has a sandwich attack occurring in every block. And what is not shown here, but what I would also like to mention is that with this algorithm giving this parameter configuration where we just put in a realistic um, gas price for Ethereum, um, it was able to avoid all um, sandwich attacks for trades that were smaller than 100,000 US dollars and only needed to accept them for trades of size 100,000 in about 10% of the cases. It depended on the pool a lot. And this basically also brings me to the end of this presentation. Um, but I, before I go right to the conclusion, I quickly want to mention that Uniswap v2 is currently not the newest um, sort of decentralized exchange or not the current uh, implementation. There is Uniswap v3 now, which has concentrated liquidity. So while in v2, we add the same liquidity for the entire price. So we show the price here from zero to infinity. In V2, the liquidity was same, uh, the same all the way across. In V3, liquidity providers basically choose where they want to provide liquidity. They can specify a price range. And then in the end, the liquidity of a pool, which is sort of all these positions together from various liquidity providers might look like this. So the liquidity varies depending on the price we're at, which then again makes this, um, if we were then to apply this analysis again to Uniswap v3, makes the estimation, especially of the lower bound of the slippage, a bit more involved, but in general, the same should hold. Sort of this brings me to the conclusion um, of this work, which is that we were able to generalize the sandwich attack problem to include both traders and attackers until a recent, most works before were just focusing on the attackers, but our goal was really to look what the traders can do to protect themselves. And what we were able to uh, highlight is that contrary to popular beliefs, traders are able to avoid sandwich attacks by simply adjusting their slippage tolerance. And this is sufficient, at least in most cases, and they do not um, face an unnecessary high risk of transaction failures. But um, as was mentioned or asked previously as well, most traders will not uh, um, know about it, this, for instance, or some traders might also just be willing to accept this sandwich attack and not have to worry about resubmitting their attacks. But there are options sort of for services to come in and to offer some help here. But um, even more so, this is more of a simple approach which fixes the prop at one problem, sandwich attacks without um, on the trader size. But there are many more sort of preparatory trading behaviors um, on decentralized exchanges and other platforms as well, which involve front running. So I think that the research or developing a protocol which is broader and can 
does not only focus on this one particular case, but can avoid front running in general, for instance, is a very interesting and also highly researched um, topic currently. Okay, with that, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you for having me.